Welcome to the Mysteries Abound podcast, everyone. This is your host, Paul, and this is episode 69. This podcast is entitled Eight of the Strangest Place Names in Canada. But first up for this podcast, an article from the BirminghamMail.co.uk website. An article by Mike Lockley. Black Country Crop Circles Prove Phenomenon is No Hoax, Claims an Australian Expert. Crop circles are not the work of hoaxes and aerial photographs of the black country can prove it, says an Australian boffin. An Australian historian believes he has buried forever the serial, as in C-E-R-E-A-L, lie that crop circles are the work of hoaxes by unearthing black country images of them dating back to 1945 and beyond. It's barely believable, but Greg Jeffries has uncovered evidence of the phenomenon in scientific documents dating back to 1880. The boffin from Hobart, Tasmania, says his findings prove there's more to the mysterious circles than hoaxes playing silly tricks. This discovery proves that claims by various artists to be the sole creators of crop circles are themselves a hoax, he says. It just goes to show that the circles remain unexplained. I hope this discovery will stimulate renewed interest in crop circles by serious scientific researchers who have been fooled by the hoax claims. Greg, aged 59, who cut his teeth locating shipwrecks, used Google Earth's new 1945 overlay, images of places taken 68 years ago, to make the breakthrough. He spent more than 300 hours scouring the English countryside using the technology and found a large number of crop circles. Two of the most significant were on the outskirts of Stourbridge. Searching the old images presented many challenges, Greg told the Sunday Mercury. Some of the original photographs had physical and chemical damage that produced circular flaws on the Google images. I had to develop a methodology to distinguish between flaws on the film and genuine crop circles. Greg began his quest after reading an article in an 1800 edition of science journal Nature. It suggested that crop circles had, in fact, been around since the 1700s. And Stour Bridge, believed to be a paranormal hotbed, was an obvious area to search. In 2010, the town, once famed for glassmaking, made headlines when a BBC journalist filmed a strange orb in the skies over Wollaston. But crop circles were not the only thing Greg uncovered while scrutinising the old aerial photographs. I also found a number of circular prehistoric structures similar to Woodhenge, a timber Neolithic monument close to Stonehenge, he says. But these were outside the Midlands. The aerial photographs from 1945 are particularly useful for finding prehistoric remains because they were taken at a time before farmers began the extensive use of heavy machinery in their fields, which disturbs the soil to a deeper level than previous farming methods. But there is one question Greg's laborious researchers fail to answer. If crop circles are not a hoax, what are they? He has an idea of how to unravel this mystery. Firstly, I believe that the claims of various artists to have created them all is patently false, he says. That is itself probably one of the biggest hoaxes ever perpetrated on the scientific community, and I think that my 1945 Google Earth work does this. Secondly, there is a significant body of evidence that indicates high-frequency electromagnetic energy is involved in the creation of crop circles. What is not clear is what generates that energy and organises it into circular patterns. This is one of the questions I hope to answer, at least partially. Those who have previously made a study of the strange symmetrical shapes, Reg Presley, former lead singer of the 60s band The Trogs among them, already have their own theories as to how they are created. They said that they are a warning about the perils of plundering our planet's resources not just two blokes with a plank and a piece of wood. 
In the blog, expert Freddie Silver explains, crop circles are organised harmonic forms that manifest around the world. The result of an energy interacting with the physical world, in this case, plants. This energy is comprised of light, sound and magnetism. That's one in the eye for the Ministry of Defence who, up to 1990, blamed all crop circles on two pensioners named Doug and Dave. The theory was debunked when the structures, which some claim have healing qualities, appeared as far afield as California and Western Australia. In fact, they have been spotted in 29 countries, created out of wheat, barley, linseed, rice paddies and even ice. Doug and Dave only had bus passes. And cynics still cannot explain what happened at Stonehenge on July 7, 1996. At 4.15pm, an RAF pilot reported nothing unusual below. Just 15 minutes later, a second airman reported a 900-foot formation comprising 149 circles aligned along a spiral curve. The media may have lost interest in them, but crop circles are still out there. Last year provided a bumper harvest, with 18 recorded in August alone. Reg, the country's best-known circle investigator, believes the striking agricultural artworks are messages from space. Twenty years ago he shocked the world by revealing a 200-foot-long penis turned up in a crop formation just by checkers. Everybody laughed, and so did I. But one week after that appeared near the Prime Minister's home, we discovered that the American male had lost half of his sperm count. Two months after that, it came out that we're losing it over here too. I don't believe that crop formation was a hoax. I think somebody was trying to tell us something. It's all so bloody weird. An indigenous Mexican woman, once described as the ugliest woman in the world, has been buried more than 150 years after her death, and a tragic life spent exhibited as a freak of nature at circuses around the world. From the www.guardian.co.uk website, the Mexican ape woman buried 150 years after her death. Born in 1834, Julia Pastrana suffered from hypertrichosis and gingival hyperplasia, rare genetic disorders that gave her copious facial hair and a thick-set jaw. She became known as the Ape Woman after she left the Pacific Coast state of Sinaloa in 1854 when she was 20 and was taken around the United States by showman Theodore Lent according to a Norwegian commission that studied her case. She sang and danced for paying audiences, becoming a sensation who also toured Europe and Russia. She and Lent married and had a son, but she developed a fever related to complications from childbirth and died along with her baby in 1860 in Moscow. Her remains ended up at the University of Oslo in Norway. Imagine the aggression and cruelty of humankind she had to face and how she overcame it. It's a very dignified story, said Mario Lopez, the governor of Sinaloa State, who lobbied to have her remains repatriated to her home state for burial. When I heard about this Sinaloan woman, I said, there's no way she can be left locked away in a warehouse somewhere, he said. Saul Rubio Ayala, mayor of her hometown, Sinaloa de Levra, said, Julia has been reborn among us. Let us never see another woman be turned into an object of commerce. After a Roman Catholic mass in a local church, Pastrana's coffin was carried to the town cemetery and buried as a band played traditional music. Pastrana's repatriation is part of a broader movement among museums and academic institutions to send human remains gathered during the European colonisation of Latin America, Africa and Asia back to their countries and tribal lands. 
hundreds of thousands of remains have left cultural institutions in the US, Europe and Australia since the repatriation movement began in the late 1980s. When a new generation of anthropologists, archaeologists and curators began grappling with the colonial legacies of their disciplines, said Tiffany Jenkins, author of Contesting Human Remains in Museum Collections, The Crisis of Cultural Authority. They've been symbolic in a way of making an apology, Jenkins said. Institutions in Scandinavian countries have come to the movement somewhat later than their counterparts in other parts of Europe and in the US, where more than half a million sets of remains and artefacts have been returned to Native American tribes, she said. Norway has become in recent times more uncomfortable about their holding of human remains, she said. Mexican ambassador Martha Bacina Coqui, who is based in Copenhagen, Denmark, formally received Pastrana's coffin at a ceremony on the 7th of February at Oslo University Hospital before the coffin was flown to Mexico. You know, I have mixed feelings, the ambassador said. In one way, I think she had a very interesting life, and maybe she enjoyed visiting and travelling and seeing all the places. But at the same time, I think it must have been very sad to travel to these places, not as a normal human being, but as a matter of exhibition, as something weird to be talked about. Jan G. Bajali, head of the Institute of Basic Medical Sciences at the University of Oslo, said he was happy they had finally been able to grant a worthy end to her life. Today it's almost incomprehensible that a circus used corpses for entertainment purposes. Hers was used in a way we today would consider to be completely reprehensible, he said. It's important that we now have a clear end to the way she was treated. And from the www.mentalfloss.com website, eight government conspiracy theories and how they could be right by Lucas Riley. Grab your tinfoil hats, it's time to get paranoid. Conspiracy number one. The government is watching me and ruining my reputation. The FBI has never been a fan of critics. During the second Red Scare, the Bureau fought dissenters, launching a covert program called COINTELPRO. Its mission? To expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit or otherwise neutralise rebellious people and groups. Under COINTELPRO, the FBI oversaw 2,000 subversive smear operations. Agents bugged phones, forged documents and planted false reports to create a negative public image of dissenters. COINTELPRO targeted hate groups like the KKK, but it also kept close watch on the new left, like civil rights marches and women's rights activists. It tracked Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, John Lennon and Ernest Hemingway. Few, however, were watched as closely as Martin Luther King Jr. After he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, this memo floated through FBI officers. In the light of King's powerful demagogic speech yesterday, he stands head and shoulders over all other Negro leaders put together when it comes to influencing great masses of Negroes. We must mark him now, if we have not done so before, as the most dangerous Negro of the future in this nation from the standpoint of communism, the Negro and national security. King became an unofficial enemy of state. Agents tracked his every move, performing a complete analysis of the avenues of approach aimed at neutralising King as an effective Negro leader. 
When a wiretap revealed King's extramarital affair, the FBI sent him an anonymous letter, predicting that blackmail was in his future. You are a colossal fraud, and an evil, vicious one at that, the letter said. A month later, Martin Luther King accepted the Nobel Peace Prize. CoIntel Pro shut down in 1971, although the FBI continued to monitor certain groups. In the 1990s, it tracked Peter and put members of Greenpeace on its terror watch list. Conspiracy number two. The government is trying to control my mind. Who doesn't want a telepathic ray gun? The US Army sure does. It's already researched a device that could beam words into your skull, according to the 1998 report, Bio-Effects of Selected Non-Lethal Weapons. The report says that with the help of special microwaves, this technology could be developed to the point where words could be transmitted to be heard like the spoken word, except that it could only be heard within a person's head. The device could communicate with hostages and could facilitate a private message transmission. In 2002, the Air Force Research Laboratory patented a similar microwave device. Republican Dennis Kucinich seemed concerned because one year earlier he proposed the Space Preservation Act, which called for a ban of all psychotronic weapons. It didn't pass. The mind games didn't stop there. The CIA's massive mind control experiment, Project MKUltra, remains the pet project of paranoid people everywhere. Beginning in the early 1950s, the CIA started asking strange questions in memos like, Can we get control of an individual to the point where he will do our bidding against his will, and even against fundamental laws of nature, such as self-preservation? In April 1953, the CIA decided to find out. The agency wanted to develop drugs that could manipulate Soviet spies and foreign leaders. Essentially a truth serum. The CIA brimmed with other ideas too, but Director Alan Dulles complained that there weren't enough human guinea pigs to try these extraordinary techniques. That lack of test subjects drove the CIA to wander off the ethical deep end leading the agency to experiment on unwitting Americans. About 80 institutions, 44 of them colleges, housed MK Ultra Labs. There the CIA toyed with drugs like LSD and heroin, testing if the substances could potentially aid in discrediting individuals, eliciting information and implanting suggestions and other forms of mental control. The CIA tested LSD and barbiturates on mental patients, prisoners and addicts. It also injected LSD in over 7,000 military personnel without their knowledge. Many suffered psychotic episodes. The CIA tried its hand at erasing people's memories too. Project Artichoke tested how well hypnosis and morphine could induce amnesia. And when the CIA wasn't trying to develop a memory-killing equivalent of the neuralizer from Men in Black, it studied Chinese brainwashing techniques. Project QK Hilltop examined ancient mind-scrambling methods to make interrogations easier. In the wake of the Watergate scandal, the CIA destroyed hundreds of thousands of MKUltra documents, Only 20,000 escaped the shredder, and the CIA shifted its efforts from mind control to clairvoyance. In the mid-1970s, it launched the Stargate Project, which studied the shadowy phenomenon of remote viewing. That is, the CIA investigated if it were possible to see through walls with your mind. The project closed in 1995. A final memo concluded... Even though a statistically significant effect has been observed in the laboratory, it remains unclear whether the existence of a paranormal phenomenon, remote viewing, has been demonstrated. Conspiracy number three. The government is poisoning me. 
As the 1920s roared, alcoholism soared, booze was banned, but speakeasies were everywhere. Few people followed the law, so the Treasury Department started enforcing it differently by poisoning the waterhole. Most liquor in the 1920s was made from industrial alcohol used in paints, solvents and fuel. Bootleggers stole about 60 million gallons a year, redistilling the swill to make it drinkable. To drive rum runners away, the Treasury Department started poisoning industrial hooch with methyl alcohol. But bootleggers kept stealing it and people started getting sick. When dealers noticed something wrong, they hired chemists to renature the alcohol, making it drinkable again. Dismayed, the government threw a counterpunch and added more poison, kerosene, gasoline, chloroform and higher concentrations of methyl alcohol. Again, it didn't deter drinking. The booze business carried on as usual. By 1928, most of the liquor circulating in New York City was toxic. Despite increased illness and death, the Treasury didn't stop tainting industrial supplies until the 18th Amendment was repealed in 1933. Conspiracy number four. The government is germ bombing its own people. From 1940 to 1970, America was a giant germ laboratory. The US Army wanted to assess how vulnerable America was to a biological attack, so it spread clouds of microbes and chemicals over populated areas everywhere. In 1949, the Army Special Operations released bacteria into the Pentagon's air conditioning system to observe how the microbes spread. The bacteria were reportedly harmless. In 1950, a US Navy ship sprayed Serratia marcinans, a common bacteria capable of minor infection, from San Francisco Bay. The bacteria floated over 30 miles, spread through the city, and may have caused one death. A year later, during Operation Dew, the Army released 250 pounds of cadmium sulphide off the Carolina coast, which spread over 60,000 square miles. The military didn't know that cadmium sulphide was carcinogenic, nor did it know that it could cause kidney, lung and liver damage. In the 1960s, during Project 112 and Project Shard, military personnel were exposed to nerve gas agents like VX and sarin and bacteria like E. coli without their knowledge. At least 134 experiments were performed. President Nixon ended offensive tests of the US biological weapons program in 1969. Conspiracy 5. The government is spreading disease with insects of war. In 1955, the military dropped 330,000 yellow fever mosquitoes from an aircraft over Georgia. The campaign was cleverly called Operation Big Buzz, and the mosquitoes buzzed their way to residential areas. In 1956, Operation Dropkick dropped 600,000 more mosquitoes over an Air Force base in Florida. In both cases, the mosquitoes did not carry any disease. They were test weapons, part of the military's entomological warfare team, which studied the bug's ability to disperse and attack. Results found that the six-legged soldiers successfully feasted on humans and guinea pigs placed near the drop area. In 1954, Operation Big Itch dropped 300,000 rat fleas in the western Utah desert. The military wanted to test if fleas could effectively carry and transmit disease. During one test, a bug bomb failed to drop, cracked open inside the plane. The fleas swarmed the cabin, biting everybody aboard. At the time, the military planned to build an insect farm, a facility that could produce 100 million infected mosquitoes per month. Multiple Soviet cities were marked with buggy bullseyes. Conspiracy number six. The government has exposed me to harmful radiation. 
The truth is, if you're over 50, it's possible. In the late 1980s, the US House Committee on Energy and Commerce released a damning report called American Nuclear Guinea Pigs. Three decades of radiation experiments on US citizens. The report spotlighted Operation Green Run, a military test at a Washington Plutonium facility. There, in 1949, managers purposefully released a massive cloud of radioactive iodine-131 to test how far it could travel downwind. Iodine-131 and Xenon-133 reportedly travelled as far as the Californian-Oregon border, infecting 500,000 acres. It is believed that 8,000 curies of radioactive iodine floated out of the factory. To put that into perspective, in 1979, Three Mile Island emitted around 25 curies of radioactive iodine. The report showed that the military planned 12 similar radiation releases at other facilities. The government sponsored smaller tests too. In the late 1950s, mentally disabled children at Sonoma State Hospital were fed irradiated milk. None gave consent. In Tennessee, 829 pregnant mothers took a vitamin drink to improve their baby's health. The mothers weren't told the vitamin was actually radioactive iron. In Massachusetts, the US Atomic Energy Commission fed 73 mentally disabled children oatmeal. The secret ingredient? Radioactive calcium. Officials told the kids that if they ate the porridge, they would join a science club. From 1960 to 1971, the Department of Defence conducted whole-body radiation experiments on black cancer patients who thought they were receiving treatment. Instead, the DOD used the test to calculate how humans reacted to high levels of radiation. The United States also conducted hundreds of unannounced nuclear tests. In 1957, Operation Plumbob saw 29 nuclear explosions boom in America's southwest. The explosions, which 18,000 soldiers watched nearby, released 58 curies of radioactive iodine, enough radiation to cause 11,000 to 212,000 cases of thyroid cancer. Through the 1950s alone, over 400,000 people became atomic veterans. Many didn't even know it. Conspiracy number seven. The government is staging terrorist attacks on itself. In the early 1960s, the Joint Chiefs of Staff proposed the impossible. An American attack on America. The plan suggested fake terrorist attacks on US cities and bases. The goal? To blame Cuba and drum up support for war. Officials called the proposal Operation Northwoods. The original memo suggested that we could develop a communist Cuban terror campaign in the Miami area, in other Florida cities, and even Washington. Northwoods suggested that US personnel could disguise themselves as Cuban agents. These undercover soldiers could burn ammunition and sink ships in the harbour at Guantanamo Bay. We could blow up a US ship and blame Cuba, the memo says. Northwoods also included a plan to sink a boatload of Cubans en route to Florida, real or simulated, and suggested an incident which will demonstrate that a Cuban aircraft has attacked and shot down a charter civil airline. Officials planned to fake a commercial hijacking, secretly landing the plane while an identical drone crashed nearby. When the attacks finished, the government would release incriminating documents substantiating Cuban involvement. World opinion and the United Nations Forum should be favourably affected by developing the international image of the Cuban government as rash and irresponsible. President Kennedy rejected the proposal. And finally, number eight. The government is manipulating the media. If you think the spinning on news channels today is bad, imagine what it would be like if the CIA still steered the ship. 
Under Operation Mockingbird, the CIA's sticky fingers touched over 300 newspapers and magazines, including the New York Times, Newsweek and the Washington Post. Over 400 journalists were in cahoots with the CIA. They promoted the agency's views and provided services, spying in foreign countries, gathering intelligence and publishing reports written by the agency. Sometimes CIA head Frank Wisner commissioned journalists to write pro-government articles at home and abroad, and as if a CIA spin weren't enough, the agency also paid editors to keep anti-government pieces off the presses. Journalists with ties to the CIA also planted false intelligence in newsrooms so that unconnected reporters would pick it up and write about it. The CIA teamed up with journalists because many reporters had strong foreign ties. A journalist reporting from abroad could gather information that the CIA couldn't and he could plant propaganda better too. Although a congressional hearing in the 1970s put an end to inside jobs, Big Brother still manipulates markets elsewhere. In 2005, the government spent $300 million placing pro-American messages in foreign media outlets, an attempt to hamper extremists and sway support. High heels, though a staple of nearly every woman's closet these days, aren't exactly the most reasonably designed footwear. We wobble and slip and turn our ankles on every uneven stone, but refuse to trade them in for more sensible flats and sneakers. Where did these impractical shoes come from? Also from the mentalfloss.com website, an article by Casey Robertson. Where did high heels come from? As discussed in a recent episode of the BBC's The Y Factor, high heels point back to an unlikely source. Men. For centuries, high heels were worn as a form of riding footwear, according to Elizabeth Semelhack of the Bartashu Museum in Toronto. The heel helped a rider secure his stance in the stirrups so he could shoot arrows more effectively. This was useful particularly in Persia, which is modern-day Iran, where the fighting style relied a great deal on good horsemanship. In 1599, the Persian Shah sent a diplomatic mission to Europe and an interest in Persian culture and fashion swept Western Europe. Aristocrats took a liking to Persian high-heeled shoes. They were bold, masculine and perfect for asserting status. When the lower classes caught on and adopted the shoes, the aristocracy simply increased the height of their footwear in accordance with their social order. They were useless on the cobbled streets of 17th century Europe, but that was the whole appeal. Privileged men rarely walked anywhere and ridiculous accessories highlighted their luxurious lifestyles. Christian Louboutin wasn't the first to use red soles as a status symbol either. Louis XIV, King of France, beat him to it by over three centuries. At only 5 feet 4 inches or 1.63 metres tall, the monarch boosted his stature with heels, always red, an expensive dye. In the 1670s, Louis XIV issued an edict limiting red heels to members of his court. Only the favoured few could wear this ostentatious colour. How then did high heels become part of women's fashion? Semelhack offered an explanation to William Kremer of the BBC News magazine. In the 1630s you had women cutting their hair, adding epaulettes to their outfits. They would smoke pipes, they would wear hats that were very masculine. And this is why women adopted the heel. It was in an effort to masculinise their outfits. 
Eventually, though, the unisex heel branched into a low, stacked heel for men and a slender heel for women, and when the Enlightenment rolled around, men's dress became more sensible and understated. The distinction between classes was vanishing, and women, seen as silly, vapid and overly sentimental, became the curators of the high heel and other pretentious, impractical fashions. By 1740, men stopped wearing high heels entirely. Once functioning as sensible footwear for horseback riding, high heels evolved into stilettos and pumps, impractical but irresistible signifiers of femininity and wealth. Fashion is cyclical though, and perhaps someday they will be seen as symbols of power and status, and maybe men will reclaim the shoe that they created. Three hundred million year old machinery has been found in Russia. Experts say the aluminium gear is not the result of natural forces and maybe extraterrestrial. From the beforeitsnews.com website. The Voice of Russia and other Russian sources are reporting that a three hundred million year old piece of aluminium machinery has been found in Vladivostok. Experts say a gear rail appears to be manufactured and not the result of natural forces. According to Yulia Zemanskaya, when a resident of Vladivostok was lighting the fire during a cold winter evening, he found a rail-shaped metal detail which was pressed into one of the pieces of coal that the man used to heat his home. Mesmerised by his discovery, the responsible citizen decided to seek help from the scientists of the Primori region. After the metal object was studied by the leading experts, the man was shocked to learn about the assumed age of his discovery. The metal detail was supposedly 300 million years old, and yet the scientists suggest that it was not created by nature, but was rather manufactured by someone. The question of who might have made an aluminium gear in the dawn of time remains unanswered. The find was very much like a toothed metal rail created artificially. It was like parts that are often used in microscopes, various technical and electronic devices, say Natalia Ostrowski at the KPUA Daily. Nowadays, finding a strange artefact in coal is a relatively frequent occurrence. The first discovery of this sort was made in 1851, when the workers in one of the Massachusetts mines extracted a zinc-silver-encrusted vase from a block of unmined coal which dated all the way back to the Cambrian era, which was approximately 500 million years ago. Sixty-one years later, American scientists from Oklahoma discovered an iron pot which was pressed into a piece of coal aged 312 million years old. Then in 1974, an aluminium assembly, part of unknown origin, was found in a sandstone quarry in Romania, reminiscent of a hammer or a support leg of a spacecraft, Apollo. The piece dated back to the Jurassic era and could not have been manufactured by a human. All of these discoveries not only puzzled the experts, but also undermined the most fundamental doctrines of modern science. The metal detail which was recently found by Vladivostok resident is yet another discovery which perplexed the scientists. The coal in which the metal object was pressed was delivered to the Primori from Cherenotsky mines of the Caucasia region. Knowing that the coal deposits of this region date back 300 million years, Russian experts inferred that the metal detail found in these deposits must be an age mate of the coal. Another question that interests Russian scientists is whether the aluminium alloy is of earthly origin. It is known from the study of meteorites that there exists extraterrestrial aluminium-26, 
which subsequently breaks down to magnesium-26. The presence of 2% of magnesium in the alloy might well point to the alien origin of the aluminium detail. It could also be evidence of some past unknown civilization on Earth. Nonetheless, future testing is needed to confirm this hypothesis. It is the first such finding in coal made in Russia, according to anomaly researcher and biologist Valerie Breer, who took microscopic samples of the aluminium for testing. Valerie Breer performed X-ray diffraction analysis of the metal. It showed very pure aluminium with micro impurities of magnesium of only 2 to 4 percent. Analysis was also conducted by senior fellow of the St. Petersburg Institute of Nuclear Physics, Igor Okunev, who confirmed the age of the material, according to Natalia Ostrovsky. While exploring core samples that were raised from a 9 metre depth during the drilling of the seabed to support the bridge on a Russian island near Cape Nazimova, strange metal alloys were discovered that were preserved in the prehistoric sandstone. The pieces of special alloys had an unusual composition and were clearly not used in the drilling machinery. The alloys, said Bria, were artificial and constructed by intelligent beings. Not so long ago in Russia, a mechanical device was found in volcanic rock, which dated 400 million years before the current era. It was found on the remote Kamchatka Peninsula, 150 miles from the village of Tegel by archaeologists at the University of St. Petersburg, among other strange fossils. The reliability of the finds has been certified. According to archaeologist Yuri Golubev, the find amazed experts, as it was some sort of a machine. And if you'd like to visit the show notes at www.origins.info, Click on the link to the Mysteries Abound show notes, and then on the link to episode 69, and then on the link to this article. There are some photographs that accompany the article. Although I think this article may have been translated from Russian and was a little difficult and strange to read. And whilst we're visiting our Russian friends... From the www.dailymail.co.uk website, could it be Nesky? Russian scientists claim to have found remains of a Siberian Loch Ness monster. And this article was written by Steve Robson and Will Stewart. Russian scientists claim to have spotted the jaws and skeleton of a mystery creature which could be the Siberian Loch Ness monster. Divers brave temperatures of minus 42 degrees centigrade to investigate long-held beliefs that a monster lives at the bottom of the remote lake Labinkia, four and a half thousand miles east of Moscow in the Siberian wilderness. And geologists told local media their underwater scanner found the remains of a jaw and skeleton, which could be the rumoured beast, nicknamed the Devil. There have been all sorts of hypotheses about what kind of creature it could be, a giant pike, a relic reptile, or an amphibia. We didn't manage to prove or disprove these versions. We managed to find the remains of jaws and a skeleton of some animal, they told the Siberian Times. Tales of a monster measuring up to 33 feet in length predate the accounts of Nessie in Scotland, say Russian academics. Last year a picture emerged which appeared to show Nesky pointing her head out of the water. Top diver Dmitry Shiler led a Russian Geographical Society mission to one of the world's most mysterious lakes, which is an average of 170 feet in depth, but has an underwater crevice reaching down to 262 feet. The lake puzzles scientists because unlike millions of others in Siberia, it does not freeze solid in winter, but maintains a temperature of at least 2 degrees on the surface. More than 3,000 feet above sea level, it is in the same district as Omiakon, the coldest inhabited village on Earth. Native of Inc and Yakut people have long claimed a Nesky lurks in its depths. Known as the Devil, testimony dating back to the 19th century says the monster has enormous jaws. Images have also recently emerged from a 2006 scientific trip to the lake when strange objects, 
one of 21 foot 4 inches in length, were recorded on a Hummingbird Piranha Max 215 portable fish finder at a depth of 138 to 197 feet. It was our fourth or fifth day at the lake when our echo sounding device registered a huge object in the water under the boat, said Associate Professor Ludmilia Emilianova of the Moscow State University of her own close encounter a decade ago. It was clearly alive and too large to be one of the dozen or so known fish species in the lake. The object was very dense, of homogeneous structure, surely not a fish nor a shoal of fish, and it was above the bottom, she said. I was very surprised but not scared nor shocked. After all, we did not see this animal, we only registered a strange object in the water. But I can clearly say, at the moment, as a scientist, I cannot offer you any explanation of what this object might be. And if you visit the show notes and click on the link to this article, there is that photo showing Nesky pointing its head out of the water. As usual, it's a long way off and could be anything. And there's also a couple of snapshots showing the screen of the echolocation device and what the soundings look like. I thought we had some strange place names here in Australia with our Aboriginal heritage. I live opposite the suburb called Inderapilly and I'm not far from a place called Woolongabba. And America has some strange place names as well, as I've noticed when I've been reading articles. And I came across this one in the mentalfloss.com website and it's entitled Origins of Eight of the Strangest Place Names in Canada. And I must say... You Canadians are funny guys. So here's the article, Origins of Eight of the Strangest Place Names in Canada, and it's written by Miss Celiana. Number 1. Swastika. Swastika, Ontario was named in the first decade of the 20th century, when the swastika symbol meant little to Canadians outside of good luck. Prospectors named the swastika gold mine in 1907, and another nearby mine was named the Lucky Cross Mine. The town was incorporated in 1908. Then the rise of Hitler caused the word swastika to fall out of favour quickly, as it was used as a symbol of his Third Reich. In 1935, the government of Ontario decided the name of swastika should be changed, just as Berlin, Ontario changed its name to Kitchener during World War I. The residents of swastika took offence to the name change and resisted the new name of Winston. The town removed the Winston sign and replaced it with the original name, Swastika. But they added a new sign as well, one that said, To hell with Hitler, we came up with our name first. Number 2. Whitless Bay Whitless Bay, Newfoundland came by its name honestly, if you believe the legend. It was originally named Whittles Bay after an early settler named Captain Whittle. But when the captain died, his widow packed up the family and went back to Dorsetshire in England. With no one left named Whittle, the bay became Whittleless and then Whitless. Those who called it this were probably well aware of the joke. Number 3. Vulcan. The town of Vulcan, Alberta did not originally have a strange name. It was named in 1915 by a surveyor for the Canadian Pacific Railway, after the god of fire and volcanoes. The town was just a rural stop on the railroad until 1966, when residents were delighted that the most popular character on the new TV show called Star Trek called the planet Vulcan his home. Since then, Vulcan has gone all out to live up to its name. The citizens opened a tourist museum, erected a Federation starship 
and play host to the Vulcan Spock Days Galaxy Vest, the second week of June every year. This will be the festival's 20th year. Number 4. Blow Me Down Blow Me Down Provincial Park is on the island of Newfoundland. The legend is that Captain James Cook named the nearby village of Blow Me Down as he had named several places in Newfoundland. So was the park named after the town? No, it was named after Blow Me Down Mountain. Blow Me Down Mountain was found on maps drawn by Joseph Gilbert who surveyed the area before Cook. Climbers who have been to the top will tell you there's no mystery in the name as the winds are pretty high up there. Now the name is attached to a range of mountains. St. Louis de Haha, number five. The municipality of St. Louis de Haha in Quebec has a name that makes perfect sense. In French, sort of. The Haha is officially traced back to an archaic French term. The Haha, which means an unexpected obstacle or dead end. This would refer to Lake Temescuata, which came into view suddenly for French explorers. The citizens of St. Louis de Haha are proud to say that it is the only city name in the world that features two exclamation points. Number 6. Lower Economy The rural area of Lower Economy, Nova Scotia, only takes an unfortunate turn when seen through the language of modern finance. The source of the name is the unincorporated Colchester County Community of Economy. From this name sprung both Upper Economy and Lower Economy. It's just a map division and there is no concrete evidence that the economy of either area is better than the other. Neither place has an official website. However, the Lower Economy area includes a popular coastal tourist and science stop, Minus Basin, on the Bay of Fundy. The harbour is the home of the highest tides ever measured worldwide, which you can see on a video link in the article. Oh, here's a classic. Number 7. Dildo, Newfoundland. Any list of strange places in Canada would be incomplete without at least a cursory look at Dildo, Newfoundland. However, the origin of the name is still a riddle. The name was first associated with the area in 1711 and was spelled with an E when referring to Dildo Island in its early days. It may have been someone's name or it may have been a deliberate joke by early explorers who did not foresee how residents would deal with the connotation hundreds of years later. There have been several campaigns to change the name but the residents always vote them down. After all, it brings them publicity and tourists. And number eight, Head Smashed In Buffalo Jump. Head Smashed In Buffalo Jump near Fort McLeod, Alberta is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The very weird name makes perfect sense if you know the history of the area. That it was named for what happened there long ago is not so unusual but that they use the English translation instead of the original Blackfoot name makes it stand out today. For thousands of years, bison hunting in Western Canada was done in a very efficient way by causing herds of buffalo to stampede over a cliff, falling to their death. The meat was fresh and plentiful and the danger to Blackfoot hunters was minimal compared to other methods. But it was still dangerous. The legend about the name is that a young warrior wanted to witness the kill from below, but when more buffalo came over the cliff than he calculated, he died in the stampede. His fellow hunters found him with his head smashed in. No one is sure how old the story is, but the Blackfoot place name translates to where we got our heads smashed. And there is no way in the world I'm going to try and pronounce the Blackfoot name, so if you'd like to have a go visit the show notes. The music for today's podcast came from the musicalley.com website. The bandwidth is provided by TalkShoe at www.talkshoe.com. 
The show notes are kept at the Origins website, www.origins.info. And remember, if you go to the show notes and click on the Facebook link, you can find out about myself, the podcasts, when they're being made, when they're being released and all that sort of stuff. And remember, if you provide feedback, it's greatly appreciated, especially via email or places like iTunes. And from the www.creepypasta.com website, the story of Mr. Widemouth. During my childhood, my family was like a drop of water in a vast river, never remaining in one location for long. We settled in Rhode Island when I was eight, and there we remained until I went to college in Colorado Springs. Most of my memories are rooted in Rhode Island, but there are fragments in the attic of my brain which belonged to the various homes we had lived in when I was much younger. Most of these memories are unclear and pointless. Chasing after another boy in the backyard of a house in North Carolina, trying to build a raft to float on the creek behind the apartment we rented in Pennsylvania, and so on. But there is one set of memories which remains as clear as glass, as though they were just made yesterday. I often wonder whether these memories are simply lucid dreams produced by the long sickness I experienced that spring, but in my heart I know they are real. We were living in a house just outside the bustling metropolis of New Vineyard, Maine, population 643. It was a large structure, especially for a family of three. There were a number of rooms that I didn't see in the five months we resided there. In some ways it was a waste of space, but it was the only house on the market at the time, at least within an hour's commute to my father's place of work. The day after my fifth birthday, attended by my parents alone, I came down with a fever. The doctor said I had mononucleosis, which meant no rough play and more fever for at least another three weeks. It was horrible timing to be bedridden, We were in the process of packing our things to move to Pennsylvania and most of my things were already packed away in boxes, leaving my room barren. My mother brought me ginger ale and books several times a day and these served the function of being my primary form of entertainment for the next few weeks. Boredom always loomed just around the corner, waiting to rear its ugly head and compound my misery. I don't exactly recall how I met Mr. Widemouth. I think it was about a week after I was diagnosed with mono. My first memory of the small creature was asking him if he had a name. He told me to call him Mr. Widemouth because his mouth was large. In fact, everything about him was large in comparison to his body, his head, his eyes, his crooked ears, but his mouth was by far the largest. You look like a kind of Furby, I said as he flipped through one of my books. Mr. Widemouth stopped and gave me a puzzled look. Furby? What's a Furby? he asked. I shrugged. You know, the toy. The little robot with big ears. You can pet them and feed them, almost like a real pet. Oh, Mr. Widemouth resumed his activity. You don't need one of those. They aren't the same as having a real friend. I remember Mr. Widemouth disappearing every time my mother stopped by to check in on me. I lay under your bed, he explained later. I don't want your parents to see me because I'm afraid they won't let us play anymore. We didn't do much during those first few days. Mr. Widemouth just looked at my books, fascinated by the stories and pictures they contained. The third or fourth morning after I met him, he greeted me with a large smile on his face. I have a new game we can play, he said. We have to wait until after your mother comes to check on you because she can't see us play it. It's a secret game. After my mother delivered more books and soda at the usual time, Mr. Widemouth slipped out from under the bed and tugged my hand. We have to go to the room at the end of this hallway, he said. 
I objected at first, as my parents had forbidden me to leave my bed without their permission. But Mr. Widemouth persisted until I gave in. The room in question had no furniture or wallpaper. Its only distinguishing feature was a window opposite the doorway. Mr. Widemouth darted across the room and gave the window a firm push, flinging it open. He then beckoned me to look out to the ground below. We were on the second story of the house, but it was on a hill, and from this angle the drop was farther than two stories due to the incline. I like to play pretend up here, Mr. Widemouth explained. I pretend that there is a big soft trampoline below this window, and I jump. If you pretend hard enough, you bounce back up like a feather. I want you to try. I was only five years old with a fever, so only a hint of scepticism darted through my thoughts as I looked down and considered the possibility. It's a long drop, I said. But that's all part of the fun. It wouldn't be fun if it was only a short drop. If it were that way, you may as well just bounce on a real trampoline. I toyed with the idea, picturing myself falling through the air, only to bounce back to the window on something unseen by human eyes. But the realist in me prevailed. Maybe some other time, I said. I don't know if I have enough imagination. I could get hurt. Mr. Widemouth's face contorted into a snarl, but only for a moment. Anger gave way to disappointment. If you say so, he said. He spent the rest of the day under my bed, quiet as a mouse. The following morning Mr. Widemouth arrived holding a small box. I want to teach you how to juggle, he said. Here are some things you can use to practice before I start giving you lessons. I looked in the box. It was full of knives. My parents will kill me, I shouted, horrified that Mr. Widemouth had brought knives into my room, objects that my parents would never allow me to touch. I'll be spanked and grounded for a year. Mr. Widemouth frowned. It's fun to juggle with these. I want you to try it. I pushed the box away. I can't. I'll get into trouble. Knives aren't safe to just throw into the air. Mr. Widemouth's frown deepened to a scowl. He took the box of knives and slid under my bed, remaining there the rest of the day. I began to wonder how often he was under me. I started having trouble sleeping after that. Mr. Widemouth often woke me up at night, saying he put a real trampoline under the window. A big one, one that I couldn't see in the dark. I always declined and tried to go back to sleep, but Mr. Widemouth persisted. Sometimes he stayed by my side until early in the morning, encouraging me to jump. He wasn't so fun to play with any more. My mother came to me one morning and told me I had her permission to walk around outside. She thought the fresh air would be good for me, especially after being confined to my room for so long. Ecstatic, I put on my sneakers and trotted out to the back porch, yearning for the feeling of the sun on my face. Mr. Widemouth was waiting for me. I have something I want you to see, he said. I must have given him a weird look, because then he said, It's safe, I promise. I followed him to the beginning of a deer trail which ran through the woods behind the house. This is an important path, he explained. I've had a lot of friends about your age. When they were ready, I took them down this path to a special place. You aren't ready yet, but one day I hope to take you there. I returned to the house, wondering what kind of place lay beyond that trail. Two weeks after, I met Mr. Widemouth. The last load of our things had been packed into a moving truck. I would be in the cab of that truck, sitting next to my father for the long drive to Pennsylvania. I considered telling Mr. Widemouth that I would be leaving... But even at five years old, I was beginning to suspect that perhaps the creature's intentions were not to my benefit, despite what he said otherwise. For this reason, I decided to keep my departure a secret. My father and I were in the truck at 4am. He was hoping to make it to Pennsylvania by lunchtime tomorrow, with the help of an endless supply of coffee and a six-pack of energy drinks. He seemed more like a man who was about to run a marathon, rather than one who was about to spend two days sitting still. Early enough for you, he asked. I nodded and placed my head against the window, hoping for some sleep before the sun came up. 
I felt my father's hand on my shoulder. This is the last move, son, I promise. I know it's hard for you, as sick as you've been. Once Daddy gets promoted, we can settle down and you can make friends. I opened my eyes as we backed out of the driveway. I saw Mr. Widemouth's silhouette in my bedroom window. He stood motionless until the truck was about to turn onto the main road. He gave a pitiful little wave goodbye, steak knife in hand. I didn't wave back. Years later, I returned to New Vineyard. The piece of land our house stood upon was empty except for the foundation, as the house burned down a few years after my family left. Out of curiosity, I followed the deer trail that Mr. Widemouth had shown me. Part of me expected him to jump out from behind a tree and scare the bejesus out of me. But I felt that Mr. Widemouth was gone, somehow tied to the house that no longer existed. The trail ended at the New Vineyard Memorial Cemetery. I noticed that many of the tombstones belonged to children. Well, everyone, that concludes episode 69 of the Mysteries Abound podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. And until next time, whether it be the Origins podcast or another Mysteries Abound, this is Paul saying bye for now. The music being played at the moment is called Hajime, and it's by Gillian Golden. Keep well, everyone. Everything undone with a rent decay, moss beneath the sun, and with a touch of rain on his head, misty dew drops in our eyes. Mother Nature longs to be in rituals of cool. Across this land